Hey, Dan here again. And first of all, I want to thank you for all the supportive comments on my video I published recently where I was talking about my feelings around YouTube and creating for the algorithm rather than actually just creating the things that I found are most valuable for my clients and being here to serve the community, which is what I'm continuing to do in this video. So one of the comments on that last video, which had an element of, I mean, not an element, it was really about decision making and how to figure out what you want to do and why is ENFPs sitting empty in a room is not the best way to figure out what the heck you want to do with your life, right? And I talked about a philosophy that basically says nothing is real except what is in our heads is absolutely toxic for ENFPs and for all humans, to be honest. In this video, I want to answer one of the comments that was essentially saying, well, you know, extroverted intuition is all about creating ideas and seeing possibilities. So how come I get so stuck? Shouldn't I be able to make a good decision? And it's an excellent question. Now, one way to approach this is about developing your introverted feeling, our second function, which I'm actually going to hold off on or I'll give you a brief overview here, but that's not going to be the theme of this video. I'm going to share a totally different approach. Introverted feeling is about knowing what is right and wrong for us. And usually for ENFPs, this is developed more in our 20s and it helps guide us, you know, in your like late teens and in your 20s, it's like everything is new and awesome and cool. And we don't really know what is right and wrong. We're looking to the external world a lot to give us that, right? So maybe you grow up with these amazing parents who teach you exactly what right and wrong is, the same right and wrong you will feel in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. You got very, very lucky, right? For most people, the rights and wrongs that they grow up with are maybe a little different than what they feel themselves. And these could involve bigger things like, is it okay to rob a bank? But probably more likely they involve things like maybe around religion, dating, like what uh, what is good work? What isn't good work? What is the purpose of life? These sorts of values, right? How do you judge a good life? And so when we figure that out for ourselves, which of course is always an ongoing journey, but tends to improve a lot in our 20s, that can be one compass, one way to know what decision to make, right? You realize like, actually, when I do these sorts of things, I'm not very happy. When I do these sorts of things, I am happy. And you know, this feels right for me. This feels wrong for me that kind of thing, right? And that can be a challenge, of course, to trust our intuition and actually trust that. And that's where this next part comes up. See, it would be nice and easy if our brains just made decisions rationally, right? We we're like a robot. We could be like, okay, this is right. This is wrong. This is what I want to do. Perfect. The thing is we don't. Now there's first, there's cognitive biases. Now there's somewhere around a hundred documented cognitive biases. These are things like recency effect. So the sooner the, uh, something has happened with us, the more it sticks out in our mind. So for instance, if you interview three job candidates and then decide who to hire, you're most likely to hire the third person who you have most recently seen because they stick in your head more. There's also things like the halo effect, which is basically that if someone is good looking, appears well, dresses up, that people tend to assume or attribute uh, better attributes to them. Like this person is likely to be smarter, kinder, more empathetic, these sorts of things. Now this doesn't necessarily apply in the extremes as some people might be thinking like, uh, but generally is the case. These have all been studied, documented, etc. So first to know that our minds are not these perfectly logical things. And if you think they are, then you're probably like me when I was 18 or so and didn't really have a clue how the world or even my own mind actually worked. The other thing that's going on is we're always having this um, conversation between our conscious and our unconscious. And probably the best way to think about this that I've heard is the rider and the elephant. So you imagine there's a dude riding an elephant, right? And okay, it could be a woman riding an elephant, but I'm pretty sure in most of the countries where people still ride elephants, there's not exactly equal employment opportunities for elephant riders. So let's be honest, it's probably a dude riding an elephant. So there's a dude riding this elephant, right? And <laughs> sorry, it's just funny to me. Uh, so there's a guy riding an elephant. That is our conscious mind, the dude on the elephant. He is trying to, you know, be rational and like go where you need to go. 
The elephant is our unconscious. Now, a lot of the time, that elephant is going to go where the rider wants it to go, right? The rider says, let's go this way. The elephant's like, all right, why not? But let's be honest. When push comes to shove, if that elephant decides it wants to go somewhere else, if that elephant's not happy, it's going to go off where it wants to go, right? There's many ways that you can train and control an elephant. Fortunately, I don't really know any of them because I haven't spent a lot of time wikipedia this, but I imagine one element is more beating down the elephant, sort of suppressing what our unconscious wants. So this would be, you know, you've been working a job you don't like for the last 10 years, even though you have this deep desire for adventure or to be creative or to do something special, that's beating down the elephant, right? Suppressing it and being like, no, you're gonna obey me. And the elephant might not run off, but it might do some things to mess with you and make the ride a lot more uncomfortable the entire time because it's not happy. This way of thinking about ourselves is really, really important because when our elephant feels fear, so I'm gonna move on to just using the word unconscious, right? So when we're feeling fear about something and apprehension, we don't usually, for most people, just openly say, I'm feeling scared of this, and then work that into our decision-making process. What usually happens is fear and other unconscious influences work in the background. And for many people, uh, our conscious mind, we're not really aware of that. So you'll be thinking consciously about what you should do, trying to make like a pros and cons list about how you should figure something out in your life. But as much as you think you're being rational, that you're like, hey, I'm gonna make a pros and cons list and I'm like a scientist, you're not. Because the thing that is fueling your conscious mind, that's influencing perhaps what you focus on is going to be your unconscious and it can push you in different directions. So. If you're really afraid of something, you're not going to be able to rationally think about it. I see this with clients all the time, all the time. Someone is making a rational argument to me about why they should not pursue their dream and it's not even rational. Like it, it makes no sense. You could scientifically analyze it, you could look at statistics and you're like, none of this adds up. But it's a fear-based argument disguised as rational thinking. So as long as we have this internal division where we have this unacknowledged fear and worry that's influencing our decision making, this is where you can end up as an ENFP. One of the reasons, I mean, this can happen for a bunch of reasons, but this is one that I see a lot, is we're all over the place because we'll sort of think, oh, I could do that and then that and then that. And we're stuck in this loop and we're indecisive and we think, you know, this should be easy to come to a conclusion. But the reason we can't is one, we don't have clear criteria. So you're trying to decide what career you should do. Well, what's important to you in life? What's most meaningful to you? How do you define a good life? What is the purpose of your life? These aren't easy questions and, and everyone has their own answer. But if you don't know the purpose of your life, if you don't know what a good life even is, like how do you look at another person and decide does that person have a good life? And I'm not saying what your society defines, but what you define as that, which is probably different than a lot of the people in your society, if you're a viewer of this channel, until you know how you define a good life, how can you decide what to do in your life? It can never work. Like imagine you have a computer and you say, tell me what I should do. And it's like, well, what would make you happy? Well, I don't know, but I wanna have a good life. Okay, great, I can help you do that. Tell me what a good life is. Uh, there you go, right? How are you gonna to come to those answers? So you've got to define these things and then you've got to bring up the feelings that are coming from your unconscious. And one great way to say this is just like, what am I afraid of? Or like, what am I actually feeling? And just sit with your feelings and be aware of this. And you say, okay, well actually, I really do wanna be a ballerina. Shut up, okay, I might be older but I could still do it. I've been told I'm actually very flexible for a man in his late 30s. So if I want to be a ballerina, be damn sure I will. So it's like, I want to be a ballerina, but I'm terrified of it. They're going to laugh at me. Teenage girls in the class are going to be like, why is this old dude here? But that's what I really want to do. And then you can address the fear and come up with a plan. 
Whereas what usually happens is I want to be a ballerina is in the back of the mind, but it's like being a ballerina. No, that's impossible. Like I'm, you know, way too old. And let's be honest, I can't actually be a ballerina. So maybe it was probably a terrible example for this video, but Hey, we're too late. We're in it. It's happening. I'm not going to come back and edit. So what usually happens is we think of the reasons we can't be a ballerina because we don't even want to face the fear we have of being rejected as a ballerina, right? So I have this dream I want to do, but the thought of failing at it or being rejected or people telling me it's stupid is so great that not only will I not acknowledge that fear, but that fear will lead me to come up with all these reasons why I shouldn't do the thing that I really want to do because that's going to make me, um, you know, that would be terrifying if I did it and then failed. So I'll come up with rational reasons to not do the thing I really want to do. Now, this can also happen the other way with our unconscious. This is why life is so fun, where we've rationally convinced ourselves we should take the safe route. So we say, you know, no, no, I, I know that I want to go to law school and this is what I want to do because it's safe and it's secure. And, you know, the funny thing is with, um, with AI that all the really safe, secure, like accountant and lawyer jobs and even programmers are basically like going to lose 90% of the job soon. Um, I mean, it's not funny, but it is funny if someone, okay, funny is not the right term, but there is some irony that a huge amount of people who took these jobs did it to be safe and secure. And then they turned out to be the easiest jobs for AI to take over. Um, whereas like, you know, the interpretive dance ballerina guy in his late thirties is like, okay, that's unique. AI is not going to be able to replace him for at least a decade. I, I hope not. That's my dream. Okay. So the other thing that can happen though, is we decide rationally, like I'm going to do this and we try and force ourselves into something we think we should do. And then what does the elephant do? The elephant is like, no, 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 no. Because our elephant is in touch with our dream and what we're really meant to be doing our calling, if you will, oh, blatant self-promotion here. There's an opportunity. Our elephant is in touch with our ENFP calling available wherever you buy books. Where's my seat here? Okay. So our elephant knows we're actually meant to have this greater purpose, right? It's too bad. I don't have an elephant behind me for this. I've got a tiger, a chimpanzee and a, a gorilla, but no elephant, but our elephant knows what we're really meant to be doing. Right. And so when we try and be purely rational, Eventually it intervenes. It kind of tries to drag us off course. It's like, no, no, this isn't where we want to go, right? Like, let's not go down this path because I'm going to be really miserable. You're taking me to the place that elephants hate. Elephants go to die, right? And so we get also confusion in that way. And then we end up confused or maybe taking a job for a while, then leaving it. Um, is why sometimes you'll have situations where you start to go down a path and then you like what you think is sabotaging it or you quit and you don't know exactly why, but you're just like, I had a feeling this isn't right for me, right? But at the same note, being disconnected from your unconscious and really what you're feeling can be one of the reasons that you don't actually go down the path and just follow your dreams because you let the fear or the worry or the, you know, thought of rejection influence your decision-making without actually bringing it up and sticking it in the room and say, Hey, fear, what are you doing? Like, let's talk about this. Let's rationally work it through. Right. And so one of the things that you can do as an ENFP is actually just get in touch more with what are those fears, bring them to the surface and play them out and just think through is like, okay, all things being equal. Am I, is it worse to be rejected as a late thirties male wannabe ballerina or to never have given it a try? That's the question to ask yourself and you'll get your own answer for it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. Next time I do a video about elephants, I'm going to bring my little elephant uh, statue thing that is in one of the other rooms here, and that will make this video even better. Uh, I did write a book for ENFPs that is 307 pages about figuring out what your life calling is, how to face fear and how to pursue your dreams. So if you're watching a video like this, I might suggest throwing down the, I don't know, seven, $10, $15 for the print edition and uh, picking up a copy because it will really help you in that direction. Again, it's called the ENFP calling. 
And uh, again, thank you for your support and your comments. I'll be filming more and more videos for you here as I have really embraced just getting back to what I loved about YouTube which was filming videos for people I care about and saying things that I think will help them and are important. I've been feeling so much more creative juice and that. So thank you for your support and see you soon.